Florida is experiencing the worst property insurance crisis this state has ever seen. New this week in South Florida, your number one concern. They don't want to pay, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for homeowners insurance. The cost of hurricane insurance, the crushing question. It's insanity to continue to do what we've done for the last 30 years over and over and over and expect a different outcome. Now, a bombshell proposal. Under our plan, citizens would become the insurer of first resort for Florida homeowners seeking wind coverage. And about face on insurers for suffering homeowners. Will it fly? But first. People of Florida aren't stupid. I mean, they can figure this out. If a voter doesn't like this amendment, they are perfectly capable of voting against it. Will you get to decide abortion rights in Florida? What you're talking about is that it unambiguously would eviscerate government interference with abortion. Or will lawmakers stay in control? The math of school supply and demand. We got to stop paying for the things we don't have, the students we don't have, and, and start paying for the students we do have. Broward's district plans to shutter some schools. What schools? How many schools? The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning and welcome. I'm Glenna Milberg. Get ready to weigh in today on a new plan to upend and redo windstorm insurance, one of South Florida's biggest, costliest, budget-busting issues. I'd like for you to think about a state, one of the three largest states in this great union that has been beset by decades of natural disasters, resulting in billions upon billions of dollars in property damage. And after every one of these natural disasters, the homeowner's insurance market gets shakier and shakier and shakier until it finally collapses. These are the problems that plagued our system in 1993. They plagued it in 2006, and they plague it today in 2023. A number of reforms done over the last two years have not yet made premiums more affordable. You know that. And while that's in process, two lawmakers are shopping a plan that blows up everything you've heard about the insurance market here. Later in the program, both are here to take that dive and you will have a chance to weigh in via email and via Twitter. So get ready. Here are the addresses. Take this down. TWISF at WPLG.com via email or at WPLG Local 10 on X Twitter. We want to hear what you think about the proposal you'll hear, and so do they, in real time. But first, a little news of the week. One of the most controversial and heated questions in Florida, now in the hands of the state Supreme Court. Will voters be the ones to decide abortion rights in the state, or will that decision rest with lawmakers who have currently implemented the most restrictive rules in state history? More than a million and a half people put signatures on petitions to get this question on the November ballot. The Florida Supreme Court reviews the ballot language to ensure it is single subject and it's clear. Florida's attorney general filed a challenge to that language, and this week, justice has heard oral arguments in this case being watched nationwide. State Senator Lauren Book is one of the most vocal lawmakers in support of abortion rights, and she was right there in the front row of the gallery for the Florida Supreme Court arguments and right here with us this morning via Zoom. Senator Book, great to have you aboard. Good morning. Good morning and thank you so much for being here. So what did we, we watch these arguments and we saw you in the front row. What did you get a chance to notice that we may not have seen? Look, I thought that the Supreme Court justices were um, really, really um, right on when they were talking to the state and asking them about their arguments. Um, they peppered both sides with questions. I thought that um, our attorneys protecting Florida's freedom um, were far better prepared than the state's attorneys. Um, and, I, and I think that they were, while I could never suggest that we would um, think for the Supreme Court justices, I think that it was a fairly positive day. Uh, when you talk about single subject, very clear language, and when the Chief Justice says, Floridians aren't stupid, uh, they know what's happening here. And with 1.4, as you said, million Floridians signing petitions to get choice and freedom on the ballot in November, I thought that it was a very, very positive day. You know, I'm going to pick up on something you just said. I think a lot of people watching, this is a very conservative court, five of the seven appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis, uh, a pro-life court, as it were. And 
And I think a lot of people we heard were kind of surprised to hear the kind of questioning, especially to your point from the Chief Justice, who seemed to indicate, tough to read the tea leaves always in these kinds of things, but seemed to indicate that, that most did find the language pretty clear. I mean, when you had questions from Curio and Kennedy, kind of in line with our thoughts um, and belief in our language, um, you feel a little bit more positive. Um, when you hear the Chief Justice, you know, while still having some of those very um, pro-life thoughts when you're talking about personhood in questions, it does bring a little bit of fear for those who believe in choice. Um, but it, uh, it was certainly a positive day to hear him say, look, the people of Florida have a right to vote on what this is. If they don't want to support it, then they won't. Uh, you know, that is a very, very positive thing. Um, we'll have the answer by April the 1st, because again, this has to go on the ballot um, and before the voters in November, and we're certainly hoping that that is the case. You know, I want, while we talk a little bit, I, w I want to put up, uh, I think we actually have a picture of what would go on the ballot and the language um, that they were looking at. And this is, this is the actual ballot language. No law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability or when necessary to protect the patient's health as determined by the patient's health care provider. Essentially, that's the core of it. Incidentally, I'd be really interested to hear from our viewers whether they find that clear, because that is the standard, cl clear and understandable. Um, but one of the justices, Meredith Sasso, had asked, how do we expect voters to understand clearly what viability may mean with no legal explanation on the ballot of what viability is. Is that valid? Yeah, and I think Courtney Brewer, who is the attorney arguing on our side, said, you know, this, these are things that the voters are not ignorant to. They understand and know what viability is, um, and certainly you do more research. Again, that is not, though, the question that is before the court today on that day. It was, is this a single subject? Is this appropriate and is this and should this be before the voters? And I think ultimately the court will hopefully rule in our favor and give Floridians the ability to have a voice. Um, we know that this is an initiative that is supported not just by Democrats, but by Republicans and independents. In the short amount of time, Glenna, that we were collecting petitions, nobody thought we would be able to reach um, the benchmarks that we did as quickly as we did, it's because Floridians don't support the extreme agenda that has gone on in Tallahassee that relates to abortion and abortion access. So uh, what's interesting is, you know, to your point, this is not about whether people support abortion rights or not. This is about whether voters in Florida can decide what the law is. And and in fact, I want to go back to viability mm -hmm. for a second because viability was at 20 one weeks as law prior to the recent restrictions of the last couple of years. Am, am I getting that right? It was 21 weeks was considered viability? Correct. And so- I think that's a moving target and they talked about that a little yes. bit. Yes, and, and what, I was gonna, really what I was gonna ask you was viability really does mean different things for different pregnancies depending on health of the mother or prenatal services or geography to healthcare, uh, income possibly. So. So is viability a clear word? Yeah, look, we believe that it is vi viable to live outside of the womb. Certainly that is a moving target. And you did hear some of the Supreme Court justices, I believe was gross hand, sort of say, you know, where the legislature has come in with a bright line in the sand of 15 weeks, 21 weeks, is that more clear? And again, I think that is a moving target, but I also do think that again, this today, this measure, that we are looking at in front of the Supreme Court is simply to give voters the right and for them to educate themselves before they hit the ballot box in November. And if it's something that they don't support, viability, um, then they vote against the amendment. But we see increasingly, time and time again, again with 1.4 million petitions collected, that Floridians support uh, having a right to choose what happens to their health care options, right? And I think that we will see that translate come November when this is on the ballot. In the uh, short time, Senator Book, we have together a little subject switch. You, uh, in the Judiciary Committee this week, uh, you were the sole no vote on a bill going through that would establish no camping rules. This addresses people who are experiencing homelessness, sleeping on the streets, making it illegal to sleep on the streets without permit. 
Um, and you're, you voted against that. I, I think your voice is one voice, but it's a very powerful voice as your family and your dad is so involved and has been so involved in helping people experiencing homelessness as you have. Um, what do you make of, of that bill? And what are the chances that it will become law? Look, I think that when you have leadership looking at an issue like homelessness, that is a, a very important thing. I can't remember a time that we've had both Senate and House leadership looking at an issue like homelessness. I, I don't know that this is the right way to go when it comes to ending homelessness. Look, the Homeless Trust, Broward County, we have incredible continuums of care here, um, but that's not the same statewide. And I think that what we need to be getting to is to create a standard throughout the state where continuums of care have benchmarks that they have to meet to chip away at ending homelessness. I don't believe that providing camping grounds um, where, and you heard some of my questions that day, where we don't know if there are gonna be sex offenders next to children in those areas. What about animals, running water? To provide a camping out area for people who are experiencing homelessness really isn't the way that we are going to end homelessness in our state. And then you see other rhetoric. Um, you had the governor that day coming out and saying, don't make Florida San Francisco. That's not we want what we want to be. We want to end homelessness. There are over 15,000 people experiencing homelessness in the state of Florida. And we know that we can make a difference. The Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust, the Broward County Continuum of Care, we do things differently than we do throughout the state. And I think that providing and allowing for the continuums of care to have a benchmark and move systemically towards ending homelessness is the right way. Not necessarily allowing campgrounds where people can be congregated in one area. It, it doesn't seem like a viable solution. And, and my no vote really um, is because I want those sponsors and I want those people to come down to, to Miami, to come to Broward, to see the work that we're doing to end homelessness. It, because it, we does, all it, it does sound like that there will be some more detail added to that. And, and in fact, the governor, when he was talking about it, did mention money for mental health issues and substance abuse issues. So um, I, I want to talk more about this on your next appearance here. We are at a time and I really want to thank you for being with us this Sunday morning. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay, hope so. And coming up, your chance to weigh in on an about face idea to lower your hurricane insurance costs. But first, the supply and demand for schools in Broward has the district eyeing closures. And we get into that with the superintendent right here after the break. Broward County School District has a math problem to solve, but calculating the answer involves more than hard numbers. The district enrollment has declined and the plan is to close and repurpose at least five schools, maybe more, but which? And how will that impact the communities for better or worse? That's all in the detail. Superintendent Peter Licato with us live today to get into some of that detail. Superintendent, great to have you aboard. Uh, thank you for having us uh, again. I'm sorry I'm not down there, but uh, I really appreciate you giving us the time to talk about some of the things we have to get done. Your voice, your brain, and your face, and we're all good. <laughs> so um, so this week, this is, this is really important to so many families, and, and you went to the community this week to get a little bit of input. Um, what did you learn? So uh, what I learned quickly is um, there's, a, there's a trust problem. Uh, our customers in the Broward County, uh, some of them have a trust problem, and, and I don't blame them. Uh, over the past few years, they've struggled with trusting what comes out of the school district and, and, and the product. Uh, what we're saying is not always what we're doing, and, and that's turned around a lot. It's turned around quite a bit, actually, but it's just not going to happen overnight. But it was good to hear some of the uh, things that we, we can actually change and actually fix. Now, remember, we're not trying to close schools. We're trying to avoid doing that. So we're going to look at every other option first, uh, programming and maybe add K-8 or, or multiple options. But that's what we need to hear from, the, from uh, our community. And I promised and I said it and I mean it. We're talking to them first. There is no preset determination on what schools. There's nothing out there that says that. We do have a report of all our under-enrolled schools, which is something we have to do every year, but it gives you a good idea of how under-enrolled we are. We're about 50,000 seats short right now. So where, tell me about this under-enrollment, because I, I looked up some Florida Department of Education stats, and it says 
Uh, Broward from last year is down 3,300 plus students, mm -hmm. but the surrounding counties are up. Miami-Dade is up almost 1,800 and Palm Beach County schools are up 831 students. Right. Can, can you, why is there a lower enrollment? And it, you know, universal vouchers just started and that would be sort of like the, the natural thing to think, but this has been a decline over a period of a decade or more. So that, that can't be it. So what, why? No. No, it, it, it has something to do with it recently. Um, and I believe uh, our surrounding counties might be a little bit more if they didn't have the vouchers. However, Broward's unique. Broward is very unique. The families are moving out because Broward is a vertical county. The people moving in are moving in vertically. And, uh, you know, you can see by the high rises being built, it's almost out of property in most of the eastern and central portion of it. So when the families move out, there's not families with school aged children moving in. Uh, it's, a, it's also a, it's the most diverse county in the entire state. It's a very, very uh, eclectic but happening place. It's a beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm up here in Delray for the last two weeks as I'm moving back to Broward and Fort Lauderdale, my hometown, next week. But there's a lot of folks moving there that aren't uh, that don't have school aged childcare. So there's multiple things there. I also have to look at what we're doing programmatically. Sometimes our, our our programs don't fit. There's not a good sequence, and we have a few schools out there that have wait lists. And why aren't we doing more of that? Why aren't we replicating them? So when before we start just shutting schools down, we got to hear from the from the customers, and they've said the same thing. You know, I really I really would like to get into this school, but there's a wait list. So I don't want to get in the wait list there. I walked into a school a uh, classroom at Pompano Beach High the other day. Uh, and I walked in and I had the 10th graders raise their hand. If they didn't get into Pompano, would they have gone to a private school and half the school, half the classroom raised their hand. So to me, that means we're doing the right things, but we need to do more of it to get to capture all our students because we still believe we put out the best product. And so even even if some schools really are a draw, I mean, people want to go to schools in their neighborhoods where their friends are, where they can go out and go on a play date or whatever they call them these days. Uh, <laughs> so that, I mean, that's got to be a consideration in neighborhoods, right? Yeah, my experience with that is making sure there's enough of those uh, desired programs, and not every school can be full choice, but desired programs that students want to go to. You know, medical programs are huge right now. Students want the medical programs all over. Engineering's big. Computer science is huge. So we need to start considering what we're doing in all our local schools because those are actually qualities. You know, computer science is not something out of the box. I mean, it's within so many professions now. Where our technical centers are, are full and they're doing really well and they're the top 100 schools in the state. So we really have to start thinking, can we, can we proliferate these programs a little bit more before we start looking at closing schools? Because that is the last option. It truly is the last option. So we need to do everything up to that point before we have to make those financial decisions. Even though the land under a school may be more and more valuable for something like real estate or, or even affordable housing? So we have an obligation as, as a community and as a, an organization that's predicated on taxpayer dollars is to look at our excess properties and think about um, affordable housing for our entire staff, for our entire staff. So we got to look at that where I'm in the works with a couple different agencies, the Urban League and housing authorities. We're trying to work on that as well because we do have an obligation. Uh, we also have some prime real estate that may eventually become uh, available simply because there's just not enough students. We're not going to recapture 50,000 students because there's not 50,000 students out there, but we're going to recapture what we can. And we're also going to look at how can we be better fiscally, because if we're paying for students that we don't have, and that's what we're doing right now, then we can't offer what we need to for the students we do have, especially our staff members. In, in the form of, of uh, wages, because now we're spending money on buildings that maybe are 35% full or 40% full, and that is highly, highly costly. All right, a little subject switch here before I let you go. Um, this week in Miami-Dade County, Local 10 and our, my colleague Hetzel Vela had been reporting on permission slips that uh, now are needed in Miami-Dade County for any student to go to a Black History Month event. Um, that caused quite the stir as a new permission slip, but what the district in Miami-Dade is saying is they're just trying not to run afoul of what actually to them is a, a vague state law. And I wonder how Broward County might be handling the same. Well, let's first talk about Hatzel. Hatzel was in that classroom with me the other day, and he looked at me and shook his head when I asked that question for those students. And uh, he's an awesome guy, but he did get to see firsthand what it's like. Now, about that permission slip, uh, we spoke with the state on Thursday, I believe, and we certainly want to be in compliance as well. So there is a there is a broad interpretation of it. There's the state's interpretation on what they really want. But we're going to follow suit with and keep in line with Palm Beach and Dade because they're very similar. So we're going to continue doing that the same way. 
we don't want to violate the law. It's it's what we have to do. We want to make sure that parents know where their children are going during the school day. And as a former principal, I get it. I do understand some of this. I do understand that some folks come on campus that the, the family may be opposed to. So I think better communication up front would probably be even better to say, hey, these are the organizations that are going to be there. You don't have to attend if you object to going, going there, but here's the permission slip as well. And if you can do it before school in a calendar of events for these parents, it would be much easier as well rather than waiting for the last week. An interesting spin on what is certain to remain a controversial subject and, and maybe a, you know, another look at that law, but that's to come. Superintendent Peter Licata from Broward, thank you so much for sparing us a little of your Sunday. Thank you again. All right. And right after the break, an idea to take back the cost of property insurance, redo the safety net that promises to make you whole after a storm and that you can afford. And we get into that and we want to hear what you think when you hear it. So take a look. Here is the email TWISF at WP, bleh, WPLG.com. Incidentally, that stands for This Week in South Florida at WPLG.com. And you can also reach out on Twitter, X at WPLG Local 10, and we will be right back. This week, a potential bombshell of a plan to redo the way you buy hurricane insurance. Bring it home, make it affordable, make it reliable when you need it the most. It's one of South Florida's biggest issues. Lawmakers know it. Recent reforms have not yet made premiums more affordable, though they say give it time, time that some may not have. This week, two lawmakers made public a plan that changes almost everything about the windstorm insurance market here. At the same time, we're trying something new here. We want to hear from you in real time about what you think. Emails and posts, you can do it right to the lawmakers right here during this conversation at TWISF at WPLG.com via email, or you can post to us on Twitter, X at WPLG Local 10. You can do that right now as you're listening right here right now state representative spencer roach republican from florida's southwest coast right here at the table and via zoom today state rep hillary cassell democrat from dania beach who joins us today from tallahassee and um welcome to you both it is so great to have the both of you together watched your workshop this week was kind of blown away by the idea a lot of devil in the details to get to and um and thanks for being here on a sunday especially i want to thank spencer roach who drove two hours from fort myers to be right here at the table with us so spencer roach first to you the first question is kind of explain to us what is basically this plan give us the broadcast version to start us off yeah, so first of all, let me say well worth the drive because this is the most important issue that we are hearing from Floridians about every yes. day. And let me explain the plan. So this is a big, bold, transformative, and I, and I want to stress bipartisan idea mm -hmm. to totally transform Florida's property insurance system. And it does that by isolating the risk of hurricane coverage and putting that squarely onto citizens. So citizens would be a vehicle now of first resort that would offer universal wind coverage to every Floridian who wanted it, they would still pay a premium, it would not be free. Uh, and in those uh, storm-free years or decades, the amount in there would continue to accrue and you would have a surplus of potentially billions of dollars to pay these claims when the big storms hit. So- uh, As opposed to the insurance companies. Right, right. And, and what we're seeing now as, as a, you know, the, the objectives are simple. There are two objectives here. We want uh, Florida homeowners to have affordable premiums and we want them to have the confidence to know that when they incur a loss, uh, there's going to be a, a coverage and an indemnification for their loss. And what's happening here in Florida is we know now that simply having an insurance policy doesn't mean that you have insurance because we see these fly-by-night, undercapitalized insurance companies move into the state, rake in high premiums, and then siphon them off, uh, and then there's no money left, there's no collateral reserves left to pay out claims. And when the big storm hits, these insurance companies fold their tent, they leave the state of Florida, and they leave taxpayers on the hook uh, to pay these claims. So I, I want to bring, Hil we could do first names here, right? Spencer, Absolutely. Hillary, Glenno, we're good. Okay, so Hillary, you, you were here, you've been here as the state, as lawmakers have been making these reforms during the past couple of years. Um, and, and so these reforms all were supposed to be a year, a year and a half, two years away, focused on the independent private market and giving them space and time to do good business here, come back to the market, be competitive. This totally turns that on its head. 
Lena, it has to. The reality is the companies that we've invited into the state of Florida are exactly the type of companies that we invited in 2006. And as my partner mentioned, these are companies that have no historical uh, data. They've never operated in other states. They are undercapitalized. They're relying heavily on a reinsurance market, which you and I both know that's one of the highest parts of what people pay in their premiums. The cost of reinsurance is anywhere between 40 and 50 percent of what we're paying in the reinsurance market. So all we're doing is insanity. We are creating the same problem that we created in 2006. And in 20 years, if we don't do something drastic, we're going to be in the same position that we're in today with companies that go insolvent and leave Floridians to carry uh, those assessments that we see through FIGA um, on our shoulders. And we, it's time for us to do something different. So right now, the uh, citizens is the insurer of last resort. What you're saying is citizens is going to be the insurer of first resort and no independent private market companies will have windstorm coverage in Florida. Well, yes, l l let me explain that. So citizens would be the insurer of first resort for windstorm only, and that's all citizens would do. All of the other miscellaneous bread and butter coverages that your homeowner's policy includes would be left to the free market. So the free market companies could come back in. They could know their risk. That's what these companies want. They need to be able to actuarially calculate their risk. They would make a killing. So this bill is very capitalistic and it only takes that area of risk that is virtually unknowable, uninsurable, out of the private market and make citizens the backstop. Uh, but uh, cit people, Flor Florida citizens, Florida residents would still have the option if they wanted to, to purchase private market insurance. I doubt anyone would do that. It would be prohib prohibitively expensive and is when they have an option to use citizens. So yes, they would still be able to, to purchase a private plane if they wanted to. You know, something that, I, I forget which one of you had said this in the workshop, that there were 12 hurricane free years in this state. And you would think that the companies who were writing Windstorm would have used those 12 years to really rack up some savings so that when the big storm hit after 12 years. But but Hillary, I think it was you in the workshop that said they the storm hit and all of a sudden they said they didn't have enough money to pay out. How, how is that possible? And, and that's why this plan that Spencer and I have put together is so transformative because you have citizens who while we call them the insurer of last resort, historically, they never have been. They cover our most vulnerable properties, our riskiest properties, and that falls on the shoulders of Floridians. So when you look at um, you know, the plan that we are proposing here, it's really to just call citizens what they are and um, to put Floridians in a position where we continue to bank those premiums and we're not worrying about that money going to pay off executives, to pay shareholders, to pay taxes. Those are three huge ticket items that citizens doesn't pay as a quasi government entity that in those off hurricane years, we would be able to back the, bank those premiums and be prepared for when that big storm hits. Whereas the plan that we have now is in those off years, in those good years, we know that Florida has paid its insurance executives some of the highest uh, salaries in the nation despite being in an, in an insurance crisis. And, and also citizens cannot go insolvent. That's just not possible. Spencer, you had mentioned, you know, I was watching this um, this workshop and I said, wow, that's that's pretty novel. It's not novel at all. You said there is a precedent for this. Well, it's not novel at all. I, there was a former legislator named Don Crane who served in the Florida House in the early 70s. He was an insurance industry executive. He owned an insurance agency and he got dropped in 2006 and put together a consor consortium of industry experts and businessmen to propose a plan like this. But let me just say this, this is not theoretical. Texas has been doing a version of this only in the coast since 1971. We've got 50 years of empirical data from Texas, mm -hmm. another large state with a coastline that this works. California has been, been doing this, but for earthquakes since 1995. So we've got 30 years of empirical data from California. This, this is not theoretical. It is working in other large states and we can borrow best practices from states like Texas and California to, to create a model that works for the state of Florida. And what, what those states show, have you been able to, have you done this yet, extrapolate out the numbers say from Texas vis-a-vis -vis what that, that would look like on Florida in the coastal areas? We, ha we have some rough numbers on that. In fact, the report that, uh, that the Don Crane 
uh, working group released in 2006 had a lot, lot more detailed numbers than that. And those reports were evaluated by Florida Tax Watch, who said this is a realistic plan. It could work for Florida. And other, uh, other former executives from Citizens have, have looked at this and said, this is a realistic plan for the state of Florida. But I would argue this, it's inevitable. Eventually and inevitably, Florida is going to have to embrace this model because this, what we're doing now, is unsustainable. If we had had another Hurricane Ian a few months ago, the market would have completely collapsed. I don't and think I, the public knows that. Well, I don't think they realize how precariously close the market came to outright collapse. And I would argue that the market has already collapsed because if you look at the infusion of taxpayer dollars that's kept this uh, market on life support, without those infusions of taxpayer dollars, the market would have already collapsed. So I would argue it has collapsed already. So in this workshop, the CEO of Citizens had, a, had something to say. Um, he was a bit skeptical. You're going to hear from him. We'll talk more with the lawmakers when we come right back. We are back with State Representatives Spencer Roach, Republican from Fort Myers, and State Rep Hillary Cassell, Democrat from Dania Beach. We are talking about a really interesting idea to redo windstorm insurance. Uh, first, I want to mention that the CEO of Citizens, Tom Serio, in the workshop we've been talking about, uh, expressed a lot of concerns, and I want to let everybody hear a little bit about what he said. This is a very different change in direction. It would fundamentally change the mission of Citizens and although they haven't taken a position, I would say what, you know, we've been focusing as the market has recovered. Um, we want to take good care of the policies we have, but we've been focusing on depopulation. And for obvious, for obvious reasons, this would, this would turn that into in a different direction. Hillary Cassell, uh, he did not sound like he was a great proponent of this plan. And I don't think he's supposed to be, you know, his mission as the, you know, main executive for, for citizens, it, he's been directed by the legislature to depopulate it. So to present something that changes that, as he says, and really puts them in a different position, I don't think that's where he operates from. He op operates from the space of our job as the citizens executive is to depopulate these policies and allow the private marketplace um, to to carry the rest. But one of the things that we didn't hear him mention is the fact that the private marketplace doesn't necessarily rebound and take those big high risk properties um, or those most vulnerable properties off citizens books. And I think that's what we need to think about. And with our plan, we spread that risk statewide. Right now, the, the way that it works is citizens, we allow these companies to come in. They cherry pick the best properties um, so they have the least amount of risk while we still carry all the risk. So if we're gonna carry all the risk, let's spread that out across the state and that way for and, and bank those premiums and not worrying about paying out executives and be ready for that big storm when it hits. So one of the things that he had talked about that he, Spencer Roach, um, was saying that the, the premium rates would have to double to be actuarially sound. Does that sound right to you? Well, look, I, I, th I think that citizens uh, should be uh, charging actuarially sound rates. But here, here's the essence of what uh, the CEO of Citizens is missing. He's looking at the market right now as it is instead of what it would be under this plan. So you would ex essentially be bringing in uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 million more homeowners into the insurance risk pool. That's how insurance works. It would reduce uh, premiums for everyone else. Uh, and then it would sure everyone has windstorm coverage. Uh, but also he's not looking at uh, the greatly reduced reinsurance that would that would no longer be necessary under this plan. And I'll tell you this, uh, we have some data. If this plan, if Hillary and I's plan had been the law 10 years ago, we would have about 82 billion, that's hmm. billion with a B, in collateral reserves to pay out claims. And the problem with what ha what's happening with the private insurance market now is that the premiums the profits are getting siphoned off to either executive pay or they're getting transferred to another corporate entity, some kind of management company that's impossible to claw back. Under this plan, no one would be making a profit, right? These, these reserves, these premiums in the non-storm years would continue to grow and grow and grow. And look, when the big storms come, if we're going to bail out anyone, I'd rather bail out Florida homeowners and taxpayers than bail out insurance companies like we've been doing for the last 70 years. So the, one of the other things, Hillary, that Tom Serio had brought up is assessments, because right now Floridian, Floridians with any kind of insurance are open to any kind of assessments if need be. Um, you know, his point was assessments might increase exponentially. You know, that's that's a lot of hypothetical there, right? You know, the reality is Citizens has issued one assessment since its inception. And as Spencer just mentioned, at the end of the day, we're always concerned about assessments. We get assessed 
in the event that citizens doesn't have the, the capital to pay out the claims. But more importantly, we currently get assessed when the private insurance companies don't. All of us right now are under a 1% assessment because a private insurance company went under after they paid all their executives. And I think with our plan at the end of the day, in the worst case scenario, that event happens. First and foremost, we also know the legislature would be able to step in um, and help uh, with any assessments in the event that we are still as financially sound as we are here in this state by moving some money from the general revenue. But as Spencer mentioned, I would rather know that an assessment that I'm paying across all lines by all policyholders across state, we know that that wouldn't likely be a very large assessment on an individual basis. And I would rather know my money's going to bail out my neighbor than bail out an insurance company executive. Have, have you all gotten any response from your colleagues? Who, your colleagues who are working pretty hard on reforming this somehow. Well, yeah. we, we have, and I think if you were to pull up this bill and look at the sheer number of both Democrat and Republican co-sponsor requests that, that we've gotten on this bill, uh, we've, got a, we've got a fairly large number uh, of folks on both sides of the aisle that have co-sponsored this and are excited about this idea. No, no Senate sponsor yet though, right? Uh, you know what, we could not find a, a single Senator to actually file the bill in the Florida Senate, but we're gonna continue to work through that. I mean, sometimes these ideas uh, take years to get enacted. But again, look, Texas has been doing this since for 50 years, California for 30 years. We've seen this idea work in practice in other states. Uh, Florida cannot afford to have another big storm like Ian and have the market completely collapse. This is an idea whose time has come. So next up, we're trying something new today. So we're going to take a quick break and then we want to take your questions and comments on this new plan to redo hurricane insurance. Still time to get them in. Here are the addresses again. Our email, TWISF at WPLG.com. Or if you like X Twitter, please do at WPLG Local 10. And we will do that when we come right back. We, we really have been overwhelmed with questions and comments. Thank you all. We're going to get to as many as we can. Spencer uh, Douglas is asking, HOAs, homeowners, observe flood and wind do not actually cover damages. Yeah, look, this is, this is the reason uh, why Florida homeowners are so outraged. You know, uh, it's not just that we're paying high premiums, right? I, I think most Floridians, uh, no one likes to pay high premiums, but when you're paying high premiums in good faith year after year after year, and then the time comes for you to use the product that you're paying for and you can't use it, that's, that's adding, uh, you know, absolute insult to injury. That is, that is the worst of both worlds. Um, and, you know, in my case in particular, I would have had more money had I never even had insurance and just put those premiums in the bank because my insurance company folded their tent, went bankrupt and left the state. So this covers that. Yeah, and that's happened for, for, for many, many, many Floridians who are left holding the bag, left high and dry, literally and figuratively. But what would happen here is it would work a lot like the National Flood Insurance Program. And because it's, it's, it's a public-private partnership, the incentive to make a profit is not there. These people would get paid out. That would be the first priority of citizens at this point is to pay out those claims when the loss was incurred, which is not the priority of the private market. It's deny, 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 delay, delay, delay. Yeah. And people get so desperate that they accept pennies on the dollars for their claim. Interesting questions from Andy. Um, Hillary, if the state isolates Windstorm to citizens as a universal carrier, what is to prevent insurance companies from hiking the cost of the rest of the insurance premiums, including auto? Well, listen, they still have to prove their rights. They still have to prove those rates are reasonable and they have to get approved by OIR to do business in the state of Florida. So if they still wanna do business in the state of Florida and remove the biggest risk that they face, which is insuring for the unknown, that hurricane, um, then they wouldn't be able to operate in this state. But we we know how insurance companies work. They like to make money and there's still an option available for them to make money, to be profitable um, and, you know, to actually take care of Floridians with regards to the other types of claims that are offered. Well, we, Linda, let, let me just add here too. Yeah. Hillary is, is really onto something when she talks about making money. What, what would prevent them from doing that simply is competition. If our plan were in place, you would have a flood of private market insurers coming back into the state because they can write generic bread and butter policies like they could in any non-natural disaster state. They would make a killing and they would never ever have to insure against the unknowable, incalculable risk of a hurricane. Mm. Uh, the private market would kill it here. Which is what they're trying to do right now in the first place. Um, okay, so Dan, viewer Dan, what happens to those of us who live in older homes that cannot be updated easily? Yeah, and look, that's that why our plan works perfectly for you, Dan. At the end of the day, more likely than not, you're already insured by citizens. So 
we would just be making sure that those properties that aren't as risky, we spread that risk. Citizens has the ability to ensure those properties that aren't on the coastline or aren't um, in a position to be updated and you would still have insurance. Okay, uh, Mark, I'm trying to get in as many of these as we can. I sure do appreciate that people, our viewers are really on top of things. Mark um, wants, says, great program. Thank you, Mark. Can the state increase the number of insurance investigators to root out fraudulent insurance claims? That's, that's fraud is one of the things that the current reforms are trying to, to attack also. A good question. You know, look, I, I think the legislature has uh, has really done a good job in this area. I mean, we've gone to great lengths, both with uh, the assignment of benefits uh, and some uh, um, tort reform proposals the last few years to sort of rot, to sort of uh, ferret out these fraudulent claims. I think we've done I think we've done enough uh, on that with the legislature. That will always be a problem, but I think we've gone to great lengths to try to root that out. You know, Nelson, this is interesting. Nelson wants to know, why can't we have a program where the windstorm protection is only from June to November, and would that reduce the cost? Which is hurricane season. Hillary? I think... I think the reality is when we're looking at that windstorm coverage, it doesn't necessarily just cover those named windstorm events. You know, Good we point. had a storm in Tallahassee in January that, um, you know, caused extensive amount of damage. And although not a named wind event would technically qualify under wind coverage. I also think if you're only insuring for a shortened period of time, obviously you're going to probably have, um, you're going to pay more uh, for a shortened period of time versus spreading it out. So great idea. I love that. I, what I love about this idea is I think we've been so focused for so long in Tallahassee on there's one problem with one solution, and that was litigation reforms. And what I've been really excited um, and energized to see, especially with my colleagues, is by putting this big idea out there, it's really got people thinking. So I love the ideas, keep them coming. Spencer and I are, are definitely open to, to suggestions and really solving this problem for Floridians. And you know our audience is gonna take you up on that 100%. Hillary Cassell, Spencer Roach, it is so great to have you here. I know you'll both be back. Maybe you'll even drive for us again. <laughs> and um, and we will keep on top of this and, uh, and see it through. And, this likely won't happen, I should say, this year because there is no Senate sponsor, but, but this is just fresh into the public and it'll be really interesting to see where it goes. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, stay tuned, we'll be right back. So what do you think about what you saw today or really anything in the news? We love to hear from you and you can connect, as you know, very easily via email or social media at Glenna WPLG on Facebook and Twitter, X, Instagram, pick it. Thank you so much for being with us and for participating. Have a beautiful Sunday. And remember, keep in touch.